good morning. This is Richard Shu, host of Shu Untied. Uh, this morning, I'm very pleased to have with me as my guest, David Block, who's a partner at Greenberg Trarg. David, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, David, let me start by asking you, uh, well, why did you go to law school in the first place? Um, I'll do this one quick since it's of interest only to me. Um, <laughs> I um, was torn between medical school and law school coming out of college. Um, my father's a physician, and so I thought medical school would be an interesting opportunity. Um, did apply, did take the MCATs, applied to both, um, and had opportunities at both. Ultimately decided on law school, but in turn there was torn between healthcare law and IP, which are the two things I was interested in at the time. Um, and as a consequence, I, I double enrolled. Um, I enrolled in the MPH program at GW as well as the law school. Uh, the thinking being that if I ended up really hating law school, I could go to the medical school, which then the uh, the MPH program was under, say, hey, look, you're already taking my money. How about you just transfer me over and I'll be a doctor? And my, my MCAT scores were OK, probably not good enough to have gotten me into to GW. But I thought once my foot was in the door, they were unlikely to kick me out. Yeah. Um, in the event, I loved law school. So um, I just got the MPH for fun. Um, but that was the theory. Interesting. So then when did you figure out that you wanted to focus on the IP part of it? Because it sounds like you were that wasn't that wasn't your initial idea or was it? No, IP was always the plan, though, um, a, a different flavor of IP. Mm -hmm. I kind of thought I, I you know, played music all, all growing up, uh, was in lots of the local San Francisco area heavy metal bands, none of which you've ever heard of because we didn't go anywhere. But my theory was that I would become an entertainment lawyer. Go down to L.A., have a ponytail, drive a convertible. <laughs> um, I ended up liking, you know, I, so I did a, a summer associate gig down in L.A., and I ended up liking entertainment law much less than I thought I would. I don't dislike L.A., kind of enjoy mm -hmm. L.A., mm -hmm. um, but entertainment law was not really to my liking. So I did not go back to Los Angeles after law school and said, caught on with a uh, local firm here in San Francisco. And that was when IP was really beginning to boom, but it was a different flavor of IP than the stuff that I thought I would be doing. Yeah. Know? Because I was litigating and because that was the era of, you know, domain names were just becoming important, right? This is this is the mid-1990s, so there's lots of trademark work. This is when copyrights were still really a big deal in the software world, sort of before the rise of open source. So you actually had companies like Adobe who were going out and suing pirates for making copies of their disks. Yeah. Um, or unbundling, you know, to buying a bundle of, of different Adobe products and unbundling them, selling them separately. So I sort of followed those those Silicon Valley Bay Area IP waves up and down and never really got back to entertainment laws, it turns out. Um, but that, that, but I, IP was always the theory. It was IP or healthcare law were the only things I was interested in going into law school. Did you ever go, did you ever dabble in healthcare law? Uh, dabble's the right word. Um, d you know, did a little of it as a summer associate. Um, you know, it, it, the, the MPH helps a little bit when it comes to doing, for example, pharma patent lit. So you understand the, the you know, the FDA process maybe better than some, yeah. um, gives you a little more credibility. Um, you know, during the zombie apocalypse, it was actually kind of nice to have that sort of background in biostatistics and epidemiology. Mm. So I was able to speak a little more intelligently about that stuff than your average bear. But, um, but no, it was, it was, yeah, fundamentally, it's always been a, a very modest sideline. You know, healthcare law, like entertainment law, is not as sexy as it looks from the outside, right? It's mostly just contracts and it's labor negotiations, um, you know, and, and it's FDA regulatory work, you know, none of which is, is I mean, it's exciting for the people who do it, but I, I didn't find it especially compelling. What kind of entertainment law did you do that you didn't like? Um, you know, the, the contract stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're, you're negotiating uh, artist deals, you're, um, you're doing record contracts, which of course are, are really very much contracts of adhesion, right? The band doesn't really have much to say about it. Um, a little bit of a sort of copyright licensing work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I've, and I've continued to do a little of that over the years. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that, you know, that, it, it's interesting enough. But again, it's, um, the, the lawyer is really not the star of that show, yeah, right? Yeah. In either direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what does your IP practice look like today? Has it evolved or what how would you describe your IP practice today? Yeah, it um I would say that it has tracked the the Bay Area market, mm -hmm. I guess is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Um 
you know, I, I came into the world doing relatively soft IP. My first law firm did a lot of insurance defense work. And that was a period where insurance companies were starting to write IP policies. And so we were actually doing IP litigation under insurance contracts. Um, that, that, of course, has changed dramatically. Um, and then, you know, as as copyrights became more important, I was doing more of that. And then as as patents sort of entered the mainstream, you know, there, there was a, a, a relatively brief window where th there were no sort of technically trained, but also jury competent patent litigators, right? You had mm -hmm. a bunch of very skilled patent practitioners who were primarily prosecutors, but didn't, patent prosecutors, but didn't really know how to go into a courtroom. Right. Um, and, and then you had the rise of people like Terry McMahon, um, you know, Ian Feinberg, um, uh, Dan Bergeson, right? Guys like this who were excellent lawyers who would come up just doing other things and saw that's where the money was, that's where the business was, and started doing patent litigation without being themselves technically trained. Right, right. I came in at the tail end of that trend where you're really just looking for people who understand technology, who like technology, who can explain technology to lay people, but, you know, who are not themselves technical. Yeah. And I think now sort of the generation right past me, you have people who are just as good at, you know, being wound up and talking, but who also have the technical training, right? Because there was so much money in IP that you would have you know, really bright, articulate people going to med school, going to engineering school with the plan of going into IP law. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, now you're not going to find sort of the IP generalist. You know, I've got a degree in science, but it's political science. It doesn't really count. Um, that's uh, my buddy, Pat. Uh, Pat Michael would always say he's a single lead, you know, economics. So <laughs> I, I think that that that's kind of it's much harder to crack now as a you know, social scientist as a as a liberal arts major than it was when I was coming up. So a lot of my work is patents now simply because I I'm sort of a legacy in that sense. You know, I've been doing it long enough that I that I So I, at this point despite the lack of my technical skills. Yeah. So what are so if you're doing mostly patents, what areas of technology do you mostly litigate in now, would you say? You know it has varied across years and it has varied across platforms. Mm -hmm. Um I spent a lot of years at Winston and Strawn, mm -hmm. uh, and at Winston, I was doing a lot of uh, andeside pharma patent work. Okay. Uh -huh. um, GT has an anda pharma practice, but it's not something I especially specialize in, and so I do a lot less of that now than I did ten years ago. Um, most of my work is um, again sort of valley centric, so it's it's semiconductors, it's LEDs, it's cooling fans. Um, you know, it's batteries, lithium ion batteries, things like that. But there's a fair amount of other stuff as well. I mean, I'm still doing trademark work. I've got a, a fun case about a, um, uh, a new property down in, um, the John Wayne airport, uh, where we've got a big goofy trademark dispute over that. I'm still doing copyright work. I've got a fun case for a very large, um, overseas based, um, social media company, actually a couple of those cases that are fundamentally copyright cases you know they're um they're dmca cases so i mean i've got a decent portfolio of stuff and then of course i, I do a decent amount of both counseling and litigation in the government contract space yeah yeah interesting um, it's kind of kind unusual of my... it's kind of unusual to do and most who specialize these days like in patent work but it's kind of unusual to find somebody who does patent copyright and trademark isn't it that's kind of unusual isn't it yeah but i mean I, it goes to the point i was making before right which is that you're you, we, we have entered an era of legal subspecialization within IP yeah. um, that didn't exist in, you know, 1996 yeah, yeah. Um, when I came out of school. And so I think today, you know, you, you look at the really good, hot, young 30 year old lawyers and they're really much more specialized in one thing or another thing or another thing, you know, yeah, not yeah. that they couldn't do all three, but that they don't do all three, yeah. both because there's enough work to keep you busy in any one of those subspecializations. Um, and because the competition is much greater and yeah. I've just been lucky enough that, you know, um, since, since I'm going bald, I must be old enough <laughs> to, um, to have been through some of the wars and I've managed to sort of protect that generalist's approach to patent litigation, to IP yeah. litigation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, the other thing that's great is that at, at any large platform like GT, um, I've got a, a huge variety of technically trained lawyers that I can tap. 
right? And who can do some of that heavy lifting, you know, yeah. get get into the deep technologies that I'll have real difficulty navigating. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about your book. You just kind of alluded to it, the IP and government contracts. Uh, that kind of caught my eye. That's not something I see real up. Oh, and then there you have the cup. Yeah. Seventh edition, just on sale. Uh, <laughs> well, tell me- A major tell motion me. picture. <laughs> well, tell me, how did you come about of that area of interest and, and enough to even, and to write a book on top of that? So that is, it's, it's very much a story of law school will present you with opportunities you don't necessarily expect. Okay. Um, the, the book is now in its seventh edition. Uh, we have been publishing it since, Oh, is that 2009? It's uh, I've got the the wall of editions uh, over over in the corner here, which is what I'm looking at. It's too far away, and my eyes are too bad to actually see. <laughs> um, but the the, the, the co-authors are um, a very close friend of mine, Jim McEwen, who is who was the head of patents at Sikorsky and is now higher up in um, at Lockheed Martin, which owns Sikorsky. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Gray, who is the head of intellectual property at the Department of Defense. Uh, John Lucas, who is the head of intellectual property at the Department of Energy, um, and and you know Jim and I were law school classmates. Hmm. Um, he had worked at a defense contractor before law school, and G GW has always had a very good government contracting program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trains a lot of contracting officers and JAGs and people who are doing night school, um, but work in the procurement space. Um, my one L year, virtually everyone would go and volunteer at, you know, at NOAA, at various, um, you know, at, at various government agencies or would would get volunteer internships or work for judges for free. I dislike doing anything for free. <laughs> uh, I have just, I have an allergy to it. Um, and so I was by God finding some job that paid me that summer. And a job that paid me that summer was the GW government contracts program, um, which was in the process of editing um, a series of books that were published by, um, God, I hope I don't get their names wrong. Um, Ralph Nash, John Sabinic, and Len Rowicks, R-A-W-I-C-Z. And, and Nash and Sabinic were the two doyens of the government contracts bar. They had written the Nash and Sabinic report. They had published a whole series of books um, on government procurements. They were really the first books ever to treat government contracting as an academic discipline. And then Rowix, who was a patent lawyer at, I want to say Scadden, I hope I'm not wrong about that. Mm -hmm. um, he he was doing sort of the IP side of that. So he had a book on cooperative research and development agreements. He had a book on IP and government contracting. Um, and I was hired along with Jim and some others to you know edit and revise the books. Well, hey, this is really interesting. It's a real niche field. Yeah. Uh, very few IP lawyers are interested in it. Yeah, I was going to um, say. And so Jim and I started, you know, we, we sort of, we learned it on the fly in, you know, in that summer. I then continued to work for the government contracts program part-time all through my second and third years of law school. Um, you know, got a couple of thank you credits in their publications and then, you know, became a member of the DC bar as well as California. And then really Jim much more than me. And I don't know exactly how he got the invitation, but the DC bar asked him to organize a, um, a training session for people who are interested in IP and government contracts, mm -hmm. you know, via the DC bar. He tapped me, he tapped his, he tapped his then partner, Mike Stein, he tapped Richard, he tapped John. Then we put together an all day course on it. Mm -hmm. And from that course and the white paper, we started publishing on it. And um, eventually we were approached by Oxford. Oxford University Press and asked if we could do a book length treatment of it, hmm. um, which we did. And uh, it, Lexus then bought that portfolio at about edition three. Hmm. And we have been publishing, you know, every couple of years ever since. And it's been a, a really, you know, it, it is, um, you know, with all my royalties, I could maybe buy a Pinto, um, <laughs> but it's really been a fun thing to do. It forces us to keep up on the, the state of the art um it, it's it's a fun little brag piece you know it, it's it interests people like you who otherwise yeah. would find me completely uninteresting <laughs> because i don't well, do anything especially is, that. do you even do you even do government contracts in your practice i mean it doesn't sound like or do you i mean like it's interesting that you write this book on something that it doesn't sound like you know you, that's not your main area or do i have that wrong well i, I don't do the government contract side of it yeah. what i do is consult with companies on the ip aspects of government contracting. Let me see. Yeah. Um, so, so 
you know, if if you are developing technology with government money, there are particular rules that apply. Right. If you are applying for a patent that was funded in part by government research, there are rules that apply. Mm -hmm. If you don't want the government to get these rights, how do you get around it? If you need to negotiate with the contracting officer on these particular data rights clauses or other rights clauses that you're concerned about, how do you do it? And there are relatively few people in the private sector who have that expertise. Hmm. So I wouldn't negotiate a full-blown government contract, right. but I would help on the IP aspects of government contract. And if you are an R&D company, if you are a small semiconductor company doing fabulous semicon design, and you want to take an ARPA E contract to get extra fast chip, you know, money to design extra fast chips without sacrificing the commercial market, how do you do it? Yeah. And I do do a decent amount of that. And it's stuff that I don't get to talk about a lot because naturally this is all, you know, a lot of it's national security yeah. relevant and a lot of it is is non-public. Hmm. Um, but so, so I do do a decent amount of that. Hmm. I do more of that now than I ever did at my prior law firm because GT has a much more robust government contracts practice than my prior firms. Mm -hmm. So at, and, and that's no disrespect to any of them, it's just, you know, different law firms are built differently. At my prior firms, I was a little bit of an island. So what I was doing was much more academic and I would get, you know, once a year, somebody would find his or her way to my door and ask me some questions about it, right? Mm -hmm. At GT, where we have a really robust, I mean, I would say probably a top three procurement and contracting practice at both the state and federal levels, um, I'm getting those questions all the time. Oh, interesting. And I've got clients who view me as more credible because I'm at a platform that they recognize for government procurement type work. Yeah, interesting. Um, and so I would say in the last, whatever it is, five years since 19, when I joined GT, that's become a much larger piece of my practice than it was in years past. Mm. Um, and that's fun. You know, again, it, it keeps yeah. you intellectually nimble. Does the two practices kind of, are there, is there synergy between the two of them? Does does that lead to litigation, litigation, or, or are there kind of just separate practices that you kind of maintain? You know, litigation in the IP government contract space is pretty uncommon. Mm -hmm. And when you do it, you're usually suing the federal government. Mm. Um, and I've had, uh, you know, a handful of those engagements. I certainly understand the process pretty well. I'll be... Um, I'll be speaking with a, uh, a court of federal claims judge um, and a um, and a district or a magistrate judge, a Northern California magistrate judge at Berkeley in April on on you know the, the the patent litigation process and the differences between the court of federal claims process and the district court process. Um, so so I mean yeah yeah I do a little of it yeah but, but they are mostly separate lanes um, and in fact you know. I'm more likely to see it in my litigation practice when, for example, you have a plaintiff that is asserting a patent in which the government has rights. You know, now all of a sudden I've got some interesting new defenses that I didn't have before, and very few people know how to navigate those defenses. Mm. Uh, where there, you know, I have my own views on on margin rights, but where there is a margin argument to be made, how do you make it? Well, I mean, there are only a couple people in the country who are real specialists in that, and I happen to be amongst them. So, hmm. so I, I've seen it a number of times on both sides, either navigating the problem so a defendant can't raise the issue or as a defendant raising the issue to see if we can, um, you know, uh, either get out of the case entirely because the case should have been brought against the government under 1498 or, you know, going to the, you know, the, the funding agency, going to the Navy and saying, hey, you know, did you really intend to license this to a patent troll? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, I'll see it a little, I'll see it occasionally. So are you going to continue to write the updates and the rev revisions? Or are you going to, at some point, you're going to look to hand that off to somebody? Oh, no, I think we'll do it until we die. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, no, I, yeah. The, the, the answer is, yeah, we, we don't have any particular interest in um in mm -hmm. passing it off. I, I think mm -hmm. we, we would probably tell LexisNexis that we would, we, I, I think we would kill the book before we, uh, before we passed it on to other hands. I've actually never liked that that thing you know i've done some some writing and some work where we're um, we're taking over for um uh we're taking over for some other authors um you know jim and i co-author a chapter on ip and government contracts in a much larger treatise mm. it's like one of these 10 volume i have it over here mm -hmm. uh, you know one of these 10 volume treatises where we're just writing chapter chapter nine of it and i've never liked that because we had to you know we comprehensively rewrote this chapter and now we're updating it 
mm. every year, every two years. Mm. But it was originally written by someone else. And we've got a footnote saying that, you know, we tried to comprehensively rewrite it. But, um, you know, to the extent they need crediting, credit due to, you know, Joe Smith and and Steve Jobs, who wrote, you know, the chapter of this from 79 to 84. Yeah. I don't like that. I find I, I would rather not be updating someone else's work. And hence, I would rather not have someone else updating mine. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know that that's that's a philosophical issue, I suppose. Yeah, do you do any teaching on the side? You seem like you would really enjoy teaching. I, I do a lot of CLE type teaching. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, I've probably given. Uh, I, I've I've probably published fifty different articles of various flavors. I've probably spoken a hundred, a hundred and fifty times. Okay. Um, I have a, a really kind of weird adjunct slot at Cal. Uh -huh. um, it, it's it's um it's part of the Berkeley IP lab, and what you do there is they give you a couple of law students, they pair the law students with a um a Berkeley funded startup, so you know Berkeley scientists who want to do something. That's usually in the pharma space or the the medical space, by the way. Yeah. And then you know they the law students draft a freedom to operate opinion, and I you know I make sure it's not a disaster, and then we work with that Berkeley company to sort of tell them the patent landscape, usually the trademark landscape as well. So I, I do a little of that. Okay. Um, but my sense is that I am not the preferred demographic for academia these days. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I say that as sort of a you know white Jewish or Jewish adjacent male Republican, you know, so I mean, um, I, yeah, I've got, I've got a, funny story about that and I will not name the names because I don't want to offend the guilty but I was brought in to um to teach a trademark class um through a friend of mine who is a um who, who is the CFO of an institution that shall not be named in the Bay Area um he said you know Block likes to talk he'd work for free um he's got a decent resume and we're trying to build up our adjunct faculty so why don't we bring him in so I went in, taught a class. I was of the impression that it went great. I was told that the reviews were fantastic. Um, I mean, maybe they weren't, maybe they were terrible. Maybe he's trying to make me feel good. Um, mm -hmm. But word came back from the dean of said August institution um, that really what they were doing was looking for more diversity. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. And my friend comes back and says, well, what about diversity of opinion? Because I promise you, he's the only <laughs> guy who named his daughter Reagan. <laughs> Um, and apparently that, um, that, that was your proverbial lead balloon. So no, I, you know, I, my grandfather, I didn't meet him, never met him. He died before I was born, but he, he was an academic career mm -hmm. academic. Mm -hmm. My dad always did a lot of teaching as well as his private practice. You know, it is something I'd probably enjoy. It's not something I can afford right now with a couple of children <laughs> who need braces. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, maybe someday it's something I'd move more into because, yeah, I, I, you know, I love the sound of my voice. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Well, David, it sounds like you've obviously found a career that you really love. Do you ever look back and wish you'd become that doctor instead? I, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and moreover, you know, my, my father's advice to me at the time, um, you know, he, he was a, a, a psychiatrist, so a medical doctor, but in, in private practice. Yeah. And psychiatry, along with a couple of other practices, um, plastic surgery, you know, are not insurance based, right? They're all fee for service. And he said, you know, increasingly, even the really high end doctors, you know, the neurosurgeons um, are, are basically, you know, beholden to the insurance companies, yeah. are beholden to public funding of medicine and find themselves in these places where, you know, th their lives are not their own. Anymore. And you my dad speaking to me would never enjoy that you you would you would be a poor fit for someone who needed to be compensated by an insurance company and who felt as though he was sort of being squeezed in all directions mm -hmm. um you know you, you don't want to practice defensive medicine you would not enjoy any of that and so um i think he was right mm -hmm. um he was virtually always right a fact that i only realized <laughs> when, when he was dead <laughs> um, but you know, or at least when, when, when he was, you know, when I was much older, you know, you, whatever, whatever that stereotype is, right. Your dad gets smarter as you get older. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, so, so I, I look at the, what, what medicine has become and I think, you know, even medical research, what it's become, 
And no, I don't think I would have enjoyed that. I, yeah. I think I would have been good enough at it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I, I think I had the the physical and intellectual tools to do it at a high level, but I don't think I would have liked it. Uh, yeah. You know, law, law's, law's fun and you get to argue and you have a great deal of autonomy. And those are important things for me. Yeah. Well, David, it's been wonderful chatting with you and I really appreciate it. I've interviewed, you know, probably a couple hundred people and I don't think I've laughed quite this much in quite a long time. Well, that's um, <laughs> job one is done then. Um, so tell me a little about the the, the podcast before we break. Since yeah. I, I don't, <laughs> didn't want to tell you this before I agreed, but I never listen to podcasts. I never watch them. <laughs> I, I find that listening to people talk moves too slowly for me. Um <laughs> You know, the only one I, I ever touch is um, is Martin Popoff's History in Five Songs. Okay. Which is about the history of heavy metal. Yeah. Um, and I listen to that mostly for the music. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, so what what is Shoe Untied? What what is what is well? How is it distributed? What's it for? Yeah. Well, Shoe Untied was a project of mine. It was basically a side hobby. I started it about ten years ago, and it was my childhood dream was to be Terry Gross or Charlie Rose. I always just imagined that I would love to interview people. And so I started interviewing my friends, basically just as a side hobby. And when I started, I thought if I ever, you know, if I get to 10 people, I'll be thrilled. And now I've done probably over 250. But the key thing to my interview is, is that I sell no advertising and okay. I only interview people that I'm interested that I want to interview. So I have no metrics. I don't track anything. It's okay. whatever. And I frequently tell my guests, and this is totally true, and I'll tell you the same thing. If the only people that listen to this are you and your mother, it's totally fine with me. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, that that would be cool. Mom, mom, uh, mom, mom died in February, so I'm thinking... <laughs> Uh, that would be delightful. Um, I'd, be, I'd be thrilled. You would be literally a miracle worker. So I'm, you know, you've got, you know, from your lips to God's ear on that one. But um, all right, David. Well, thanks so much, and I really appreciate your taking the time. Hey, it's my pleasure. Um, you know, send send me the link when this is done, so I at least know where to, uh, you know, send it to my sisters. Definitely. This is Richard Chu and David Block. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.